together at least 5 million toothpicks, creating at least 120 structures, using at least 50 gallons of glue, and at least 400 rolls of masking tape.
morning. Happy New Year. <laughs> Good to be with you if, you if you haven't yet. Well, even if you have, take a little bit to greet the people around you a little more this morning. We'll turn to the blue paperback songbook for our opening hymn on page 186. Lift every voice and sing. stand. We remember our baptism as we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. 
but Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ faithful in our calling as your children and make us heirs with him of everlasting life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We turn to page 733. 
in the Pew Bible for our first reading this morning. Today we celebrate the festival of the baptism of our Lord when Jesus stood in the River Jordan to be baptized and the heavens opened and the voice from heaven said, This is my son. I love him. I'm very pleased with him. We have that same kind of a voice from heaven talking about Jesus here in our first reading. The prophet Isaiah looking ahead 700 years to how God would speak about his son. Isaiah 49, starting with verse 1. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. We hear in Psalm 2, again, the voice of God speaking about his son. Please join in as you can. Why do the heathen nations rage and foolish peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth, they set themselves in league. Their rulers all conspire against the Lord, against the King and his anointed one, they say. Let us asunder, burst their bonds, and cast from us their cords away. He who in heaven sits shall laugh, the Lord will mock them all to scorn. Then he will speak in wrath to them, a terror he will vex them sore and say to them yea as for me my king I set on Zion's hill his sure decree I will declare all that the Lord has said to me you are my son and on this day I have begotten thee, and so ask me, and I will surely make the nation's thine inheritance. The ends of earth ye shall possess, and ye shall break the kings of men with iron rod as potter's clay shall break them into pieces then now therefore hold ye kings be wise be warned ye rulers of the earth 
Serve thou the Lord and serve with fear. Rejoice with trembling, fear with mirth. Kiss ye the Son, lest in his wrath ye perish there along the way. Or quickly kindleth his wrath, but blessed are all who in him stay. Our second reading is on page 1146 in the Pew Bible. Also serves for our sermon this morning. From Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6. We see Jesus have power from the Holy Spirit from his baptism. He goes right into the wilderness to fight the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And we might wonder, well, is that same kind of power in our baptism St. Paul says, yes, it really is. We read from Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is God's Word. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me in the Alleluia's. <coughs> Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. The gospel this morning is on page 1001 in the Pew Bible. From Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 4, we read about the ministry of John the Baptist and then how he baptizes our Savior Jesus. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair 
with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey, and this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you haven't already, would you grab that blue friendship register in your pew and fill that out, pass it down to the other people sitting with you. If you don't know their names, there's a good chance for you to, to learn their names too. Uh, as long as I'm making announcements, I'll just point out this little insert that you should have in your bulletin. On the one side are some blanks to fill in if that kind of thing helps you follow along with the message today. On the other side is a tear-off portion that you can volunteer for some service opportunities coming up or, or uh, give me your prayer requests that I can pray for you this week. Uh, we'll collect those after the message a little bit later. But right now, I'd love to have the children come forward for a little children's message. Good morning. Let's sit by Micah. Okay, let's sit by Micah. Oh, you want to sit right there? That's a good spot. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, this past week, I have had a, an animal in my house that I didn't really want to be there. I saw it moving around in different rooms in the house. Do you want to guess what kind of an animal it was? A mouse? Any other guesses? No? I brought it. I brought it to church. I have the very animal. You want to see it? Okay, let me get it. Watch out. Stand up. Got it right over here. Okay. It's in here. There it is. <laughs> you tell what kind of animal it is? A spider, yeah. You see it? It. Uh, how come it isn't afraid of me? How come it isn't crawling around? Can you tell? It's not moving or anything. Yeah, it's dead. Yeah, I smooshed it. <laughs> I smooshed it. You can see it there. Oh, it's kind of legs are falling off. See? See, it's, it's okay. It's not going to jump. It's dead. It's okay. You see the dead spider, Ezra? See it? Oh, no, no. Yep. Oh, right there. Yep. You aren't afraid of it, are you? Yeah. You think uh, if we leave it here, you think it will make a web? That's what spiders do, isn't it? They make webs. So if I put it here, you think maybe it'll start making a web? No, why not? You're going to check it out some more, Ezra? What? Why, how come it's not doing anything? How come it's not making a web, Ava? It's dead? Dead spiders don't, don't make webs? No? What if I stop my foot right next to it? You think it'll jump away? Does it be afraid? Let me see. Wasn't afraid. It didn't jump. How come it's not afraid of me? Am I not stomping hard enough? It was tough over there. Oh, oh, the paper moved. How come it's not afraid? Oh, because it's dead. You mean dead things don't get afraid? Dead spiders don't get afraid? No? Yeah. 
Did you hear the word dead in one of our readings today, our Bible readings? It said that we are dead. It said that we are dead to something. Do you remember what it said we are dead to? To sin. Yeah. Just like that spider doesn't do anything. No matter how hard I stamp or stomp or if I put it in a really nice dark corner and it would be the perfect spot for a web, it wouldn't do anything because it's dead. And so the Bible says we're dead to sin. So sin can do whatever it wants and we, we, just, we just ignore it. We can just ignore it. And did you hear what made us dead to sin? It started with a B. Something that Jesus had done to him in the river. Oh, yeah. Getting baptized made us dead to sin. So sin can't boss us around anymore. It's like we're dead to it. That's what we're going to hear about in the sermon today, how we can find power in our baptism to be dead to sin, just like that spider is dead to my stomping right next to it. Should we pray about that? Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for having us be baptized and for all the power in baptism to take our sins away and to make us your child and to make so we can go to heaven, but also to make us really dead to sin. Help us to learn what, what that is about today. Help us to listen to the sermon and to really live every day like we are dead to sin. We pray to you in your name, Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right, you think you can get around that spider? Or should I move it out of the way? I can move it out of the way. So you don't have to step by. Okay. Wait, let me get that out of there. There we go. There we go. Sorry if I scared you. Okay. We're going to join in the next hymn.
my dear Garden Homes family. My son Tommy and I share something, and that is we were baptized on the very same date, August 26. Of course, it's 34 years apart, but August 26, 1973, I was baptized, Resurrection Lutheran Church on the south side, and then 34 years later, I had the privilege, August 26, 2007, of uh, baptizing my own little guy, my Tommy. That's a neat thing. And uh, we, we think about that every year. And that's good, right? It's good to think about the day you're baptized and uh, remember that, maybe look at pictures of it. And yet it, it is easy for us to leave baptism in the past. Huh? I was baptized August 26, 1973. Instead of every day, right, I am baptized. What does that mean for today? What kind of power do I have from baptism this very day? If you are like me, that is not a kind of thinking that is in your head very often. Rather, most days, you go through the day finding zero sanctifying power in baptism. Power to make you holier. Power to help you love other people more. Power to be a better version of you. That's what sanctifying means, right? It's kind of like saint, sanctifying. <laughs> make you more of a saint. Make you holier. If you're like me, that is not something you find in baptism day after day. You are not thinking about your baptism and finding energy and it gas for your holy engine to, to, to be a more loving, patient, generous person. It's almost like we think thinking about baptism is more for the professionals <laughs> or for the really spiritual people or maybe for somebody like Jesus. So sure, Jesus, I mean, he got power from his baptism to go and fight the devil in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. And, and he said no to all it, right? Jesus, somebody like that could get power out of baptism every day. But me, I don't know. It's almost like... Uh, like Michelangelo looking at a big piece of stone. You and I, we just see a stone there. But Michelangelo, he, he sees he's going to make a priceless work of art out of it. Or Walter Payton seeing a bunch of big men coming at him, and he finds a way to the touchdown. He sees the touchdown, and I, I, hope, I hope it doesn't come back to bite me later today, but that's when the bears were actually good, right? Or, or, or how about this guy here? What he sees in a, in a box of toothpicks. I, I have put together at least 5 million toothpicks, creating at least 120 structures, using at least 50 gallons of glue, and at least 400 rolls of masking tape. We right? I mean, he sees toothpicks, and he makes skyscrapers out of them, 20 feet tall, or versions of Yankee Stadium, 12 feet across. And, and, and we almost think of baptism that way. Like somebody really special, they might, you know, they might be able to think about their baptism every day and get actual power out of it. Like it would actually change their life every day. Jesus, for example, he could do the but, but that is not how baptism is, is for me. We go through life like that, don't we? And, and here comes God with the words of St. Paul in, in Romans chapter 6 and saying, I, I, I want something better than that for you. I want something better than zero sanctifying power from your baptism. I'm going to use my words today to reconnect you to the power of your baptism, God says, to plug you back in to that sanctifying, sanctifying, holy-making, love-filling power, that transformative power of baptism. I'm going to use my word today from Romans chapter 6 to get that going again in your everyday life. So it's something better than zero sanctifying power in your baptism and something better than someday, someday sanctifying power in your baptism. You know, like, oh yeah, someday if I think about baptism enough, it'll actually help me be a better person. 
Or someday, you know, if I'm really am praying about my baptism or memorizing baptism hymns and singing them before I go to bed every night or something, you know, eventually enough grace will fill up my heart that I stop this bad habit of mine or that sin in my life. Someday. You didn't hear any kind of someday in our verses from Romans chapter 6. No, rather, he, he says, no longer, right? No longer, no longer. That it's not just someday baptism will make me like I'm actually dead to sin. No, right now you are dead to your very next sin. No, someday, someday, someday. Someday is not a day of the week. <laughs> but dead to your very next sin sin, and the next one after that, and the next one after that. That is how God talks here in Romans chapter 6. And he says it so many different ways in 11 verses. He says it so many different ways. It's, it's, like, it's like he, he, did you get that one? Yeah, that's the theme. Okay, I'm getting caught up with my own slides here. But he says it again and again. So it's like you will never run out of ways to say no to sin right now. He just repeats it the one way after another, right? He, he says, go on sinning by no means. And then the very same verse, verse 2, he says, how can we any longer? No, this is stopping right now. Huh? He says in, in verse 6, sin done away with. It's gone. huh? And again in verse 6, we're no longer, there's a word again, no longer slaves to sin. And in verse 7, we're freed from sin. How about in verse 9, again, that phrase, no longer. Verse 10, once for all, it's done. And it, <laughs> why does sin have this power? I'm just going to back up here. Why does sin have this power gone out of our lives? We're going to get to that in a little bit, but just let's rest in, the, in all those different phrases, all those different ways that God says it's done. The power of sin is done. So that whatever kind of sin tries to waltz into your little life, you can say, no longer. No, by no means. Pick whatever phrase you want from that list. Some kind of temptation presents itself to you knocking on your front door, and you say, no, you have no mastery over me. Your power over me is done away with once for all. Because why? Because baptism put me into Good Friday, put me into Easter Sunday. All of us, Paul says in verse 3 of our chapter, all of us, he says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? Into his death, into Good Friday. Baptism puts you into Good Friday on the cross with Jesus and Easter morning in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. This is the power of baptism. Puts you into Good Friday, puts you into Easter morning so that I, I can say my body of sin, my old self, what does he say in verse 6, has been crucified with Christ. That sinful, selfish crud in my heart, crucified with Christ. And now, what? Easter morning, I am alive to God. I live a new life. This is the power of baptism. And when we go through life as if baptism had no power, as if baptism had zero sanctifying power for my everyday life, then it's like we're, I've been baptized into the wrong holiday. Right? You are not baptized into live it up Mardi Gras. <laughs> you are not baptized into booze it up drinks giving. Have you heard of drinks giving? Apparently that's a thing. The, the night before Thanksgiving is the busiest drinking day in bars in America. So you know, they started calling it. And you have bars with advertisements like this. Drink. You are not baptized into drinks giving. You are not baptized into May 9th, Lost Sock Memorial Day. No, maybe Lost Sinful Self Memorial Day. You are not baptized into September 16th. Stay away from Seattle Day. No. <laughs> Stay away from Sin Day, maybe. You are not baptized into May 30th. National Hole in My Bucket Day. 
whatever that's about. I don't know. But holy in my heart day. Right? You're baptized into Good Friday and Easter morning. Like baptism took you out of your mother's arms or the pastor's arms, whatever, and put you in those days in Christ. And so, so what? So uh, I am dead to sin and alive to God. This is the way I am to count myself, our verses say. All those other phrases, no longer, no longer, no longer, done away with, all, right? The big one in our verses is, is dead, died. Like that horrible spider I had up in front earlier, huh? Dead. And, and we can talk about why death is a perfect metaphor for our new relationship with sin, huh? Because for one thing, death is usually irreversible. It's not like, hey, I'll see you Tuesday because tomorrow I'm going to be dead. <laughs> you don't just die usually and then come back from it. And so uh, with baptism, it, it's supposed to have taken us away from the power of sin and, in a way that we never go back. Irreversible. And, and death is something that makes you unresponsive. You look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9, for example, where Solomon talks about in death, there is no love. <laughs> there is no hate. The dead feel no jealousy. The dead do not work. The dead do not plan. The dead do not think. The dead do not know. The, a dead person doesn't talk back to you. That's one of the awful things about death, isn't it? Because a person we loved can no longer respond to us. But that makes death this perfect metaphor for our relationship with sin. Now, sin can come calling, and I don't have to listen. I don't even have to see it. Dead people don't hear. Dead people don't see. Dead people don't answer. Sin can come calling, and I don't answer because I'm dead to sin. I'm unresponsive to sin. Death destroys your flesh. You can Google it. How long does it take a dead body to start smelling? Or what, what happens to a dead body? And it will tell you all the gory details about how death putrefies you and bloats you and eventually liquefies you and skeletonizes you. I didn't even know there was a word to be skeletonized, but it's there. Death makes your teeth and your hair fall out. Everything makes your body gone. And so in our verses, it says, right, the body of sin, the body of sin has been done away with, has been crucified. My sinful flesh, the part of me that just loves myself and just wants pleasure all the time, baptism has destroyed that, has made it skeletonized, putrefied, etc. Death. Ends slavery. No matter how cruel your master was, once you are dead, he can no longer boss you around. You don't have to take orders from him anymore. And if he wants to whip you, you aren't going to feel it. Death ends slavery. And so our verses talk about baptism ending our slavery to sin. It no longer has mastery over us. Verse 7, anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Death is this beautiful metaphor, a perfect metaphor. I don't know if death is beautiful, but it's a perfect metaphor for our new relationship to sin because it's what our sin deserves. All the sin in us deserves death. Later in the same chapter of Romans, Romans 6, verse 23, what does Paul say? The wages of sin is, is death. Why does sin deserve death? Well, because for one thing, God is so great and wonderful and good and holy, and he is worthy of all adoration and praise and glory and strength and riches. And so to sin, right, any kind of sin is a horrible, shameful, low insult against his majesty, right? This so, so far the opposite of what God deserves. Every single sin, it deserves death. Or love, 
Love is so good and holy and beautiful and helpful, and every sin is an attack against love. And so it deserves the worst kind of punishment, death. Death is what all the sin in us deserves. And baptism gave the sin in us what it deserves. Put it to death. Death, perfect metaphor, because that's what Jesus did to save us. He took the death we deserve onto himself. He took it so that, so that he could pay for all our sins and all of our guilt so that we could be forgiven. If we ever think about baptism, that's probably what we think about it for, huh? That it gave us that forgiveness that Jesus won at the cross by his death. And so here he says baptism puts us into the death of Jesus. All of that forgiveness, all that Jesus did to take care of our sin. Baptism gives us that. And finally, you have to die before you can rise again. Baptism made us dead to sin so that just as Christ is raised from the dead, we can live, live a new life. This is the power of baptism. Your baptism, my baptism, all of us. Don't you know, he says, don't you know, all of us who are baptized into Christ, we're baptized into this. And so the next sin that tries to take me away from Jesus, no, I'm dead to you. Dead to my very next sin. But we say, well, but it, there's a way that death isn't a perfect metaphor for my new relationship to sin. Because if you're dead, it doesn't matter if you remember you're dead. It doesn't, nobody needs to remind you that you're dead. You're just going to be dead either way. You don't have to count your sin. That's how our verses end, huh? Verse 11, after Paul says all these things about baptism and being dead to sin, then he says, that's why you don't ever feel like sinning anymore. No, no. In fact, he says, so remember this, huh? Count yourself dead to sin. Think about yourself this way. Because it's so easy to go through life not believing in the power of baptism. That's really what we're talking about. When we talk about going through every day, getting zero sanctifying power from baptism, we're really talking about not believing baptism has that power. Not looking to baptism for any kind of power to make me holier. This is a, an awful way that sin tries to still be present in our lives. But instead of us being oblivious to sin, sin tries to make us oblivious to the power of baptism. We are certainly, as much as we want to believe and confess the power of baptism to make us holier people. We're not teaching some kind of a perfectionism, huh? that there will be a time in this life where you actually don't sin anymore. If we, we read about this great power of baptism in Romans chapter 6, and then in Romans chapter 7, we, we, we read about Paul himself still struggling to find that power, to use that power, right? Struggling with sin. He says in Romans chapter 7, I, what I hate, I do. The evil I don't want to do, I keep doing. And it's not really me doing it. It's not the new baptized me doing it. It's the sin living in me that does it. What a wretched person I am. Who's going to save me from this body of death? Isn't that something? In the last chapter, he said the body of sin and death was already done. It's gone. It's on the cross. It's buried in the tomb. And then in chapter 7, he says, who's going to save me from this body of death? Because why? Because it's so easy for us not to believe baptism did what it did. Not to wake up Monday morning and say, all right, I'm baptized. Watch out, sin. You don't mean anything to me. But to go back to the same way of living, the same way of living day after day, like, like baptism had no power. And so all the power is in baptism, 
And I don't want this next part of the sermon to make it think like, well, if you really want baptism to do something for you, then it's all about you. <laughs> it's all about you and turn this into a self-help book or something. And yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some concrete actions that we can take to make it more likely we're actually going to remember our baptism and use its sanctifying power in our life from day to day. And certainly a lot wiser people have written about how to change your life or, or more holy people than I have written about how to change your life. And yet I can look back over 50 years and see, okay, there were some things I really needed to change. And by the grace of God and with the help of my loved ones, I have made changes in my life. So maybe I can say a little bit. But, but the thing is, you want to change, right? New Year's resolutions, okay, a loved one of mine, uh, New Year's Day, I called a loved one of mine to say, see how they were doing. They said, have you made any revolutions so far? And I said, yes, I've, I've overthrown several governments already this year. <laughs> New Year's resolutions, not revolutions, unless you're revolting against sin. But things a dead person doesn't need that might be helpful, right? Maybe a list. Dead people don't need to make lists. What am I going to do today? Oh, I think three more of my teeth will fall out today. And my eyeball will putrefy it. right? Dead people don't need to make lists. But maybe you, you do. What a statistic I saw. Only 3% of people actually write down what they intend to accomplish. And they tend to get five to ten times more done than the people who don't. Another statistic, you make a list of what you're going to do today, you're, you're, being, you're going to be 25% more efficient with your time. Like you're getting two more hours out of your day. I don't know where they come up with this stuff, but that's what they say. But the fact is, you write something down that, that's showing what you're actually thinking through. Okay, what needs to happen today? Or what challenges am I going to face today? Or what are some distractions I'm going to have to avoid today? Or what are my actual goals? And what are steps I need to take to reach those goals? Isaiah says, the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. It can help you to write some things down. What are some sins I'm likely to face today? And then, from a mom in the, what, 100 Things You Can Do Faster book. I don't know. I got it from the library. A mom who has uh, twins and sex tuplets. And her chapter, little chapter was how to get more things done on your to-do list. And, and she says, this is step one. Take a deep breath. And actually take some time to think, okay, what should my life look like? Or what should my day look like? Not just going on autopilot. Not letting the remote control menu on your TV dictate what your day is going to be. But, but taking time to pause and think. What does living for God, what does being alive to God look like? Different from, from what my life looks like right now. If you got your ladder leaning up against the wrong wall, every step you take up that ladder is a step in the wrong direction. So to take a break and, and make sure your ladder's up on, on, the, on the right wall. Third thing, dead people don't need, dead people don't need mirrors. They're probably glad they can't look in them. But to, to have some kind of mirror to look at yourself and, and see what needs to be changed. There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death, says the book of Proverbs. Or a comedian, Emo Phillips, said something like this, Yeah, I used to think the brain was the most amazing part of me, but then I realized who was telling me that. We, we can be overconfident. Another success book, he, he says, here's the key to, to the most successful people. This is the key, is you don't just pay attention to when things go right, but you pay very close attention to what you have done wrong. 
So you get in a fight with somebody in your family and you don't just try to move on. You think, okay, what did I do to contribute to that? Uh, or you have a lousy day at work uh, and then you actually think, okay, what, what did I do that made it lousy? And how am I going to change that? Then so you can do that some, just looking at yourself. In other words, not being like the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who supposedly blacked out the rear window on his car just to show he never looks back. <laughs> no, not like that. Not that we want to dwell on the past as if we aren't forgiven, as if Jesus didn't die for our sins, but to, but to give careful thought to your ways, as the prophet Haggai had to tell the people. And maybe you can do that somewhat on your own, or you hold up God's word to yourself, or you hold up the example of Jesus to yourself. Okay, what are some ways I'm not like Jesus right now? And how, how am I going to be doing something about that? Or to have other people in your life who can be a mirror for you because they're your role models or because they're your prayer partners or because they're your spouse and they've been telling you for 20 years, would you stop doing this? Well, maybe that's a mirror you should look at and, and stop, whatever that is. And finally, a fourth thing that might be helpful, dead people don't need refrigerator doors. But uh, whatever your refrigerator door is, but something where you're, you've written this thing down that needs to be changed or these goals that you have and to put them out there on your social media or with your prayer partner or your refrigerator door, whatever, so that someone else can be praying for you, can be holding you accountable, can be encouraging you, can be calling you out. I mean, those, are, those things aren't going to give baptism any more power, none of those things. Give baptism more power. I mean, baptism has the power of Good Friday and the cross and the empty tomb Easter morning. What could be more powerful than that? Baptism has already crucified you to sin. And yet, what, what are you going to do to interrupt your routine so that you actually believe that and think about that and find power in the power that is in your baptism? But here's what I think is, is the most beautiful thought in Romans chapter 6. I mean, it's beautiful to think about sinning less and loving people more. That's beautiful too. But this is, to me, the most beautiful thought. There's some ways in which Romans, these verses from Romans, Romans chapter 6 are very repetitive. It's like, okay, you just spend a whole paragraph talking about how baptism may be dead, and so now I'm going to be dead to sin, and then I'm going to be alive again. And then he like spends a whole other paragraph on that, Verses 8 through 10, it's, it's almost the very same thing, but if you read verses 8 through 10, you can see the emphasis is different. The emphasis is on resurrection. Jesus doesn't have to die anymore. He's done with death. He's dead to sin, and now he's alive to God. And then in verse 11, in the same way, in the very same way that Jesus, Easter morning, was done with sin and alive to God, in that very same way, baptism makes you alive to God. Think about it like that. Count yourself like that. Dead to sin and alive to God like Jesus, Easter morning. How dead to sin was Jesus, Easter morning? I mean, Jesus was dead to sin his whole life, wasn't he? It's not like Jesus ever had a part of him that said, oh, man, I really want to whatever, whatever bad thing you could put in. He never had that in him, that sinful part. Temptation made him hurt. Temptation was hard. Temptation was, was, a, was suffering for him, the Bible says. And yet, always, he loved God with his whole heart. But then you think, okay, Easter morning, it's like Jesus was even more dead to sin because now he didn't even have to mess with being tempted anymore. He didn't have to have any kind of suffering from sin. He didn't have any of the effects of sin in his life, in his body, in his mind, in his heart anymore. Right? He was done with that. And all, it was all about God and the glory of God and living for God. There's Jesus, Easter morning, with Mary Magdalene. Say, why are you weeping, woman? 
And that's Jesus. Easter morning is just all about undoing the effects of sin, the grief of sin forever in other people, but, but never having that anymore in himself. And this is what baptism does. This is the power of baptism that I can, can wake up every morning and say, I am baptized. God looks at me as dead to sin and alive to God like I'm walking out of the tomb Easter morning. And there's nothing, there's nothing that sin can do to touch me or grab hold of me or, or punish me or master me anymore. It's not like that at all. No, it's like, all right, God, we're done with all that, aren't we? All the suffering is done. All the cross is done. And now it's just you and me and glory and praise and worship forever. Think about how at his baptism, God could say to Jesus, you are well-pleasing to me. And Jesus was just starting. <laughs> how much more on Easter morning, you are well-pleasing to me. Or at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus might have said, yeah, like in Isaiah chapter 49, where, what am I getting out of all this? Where's my reward? He wasn't saying that anymore Easter morning. No, not at all. And that's the power of baptism, to make me as alive to God as Easter Jesus. Dear Jesus, would you help me every day to believe that? And however you need to interrupt my routine to get me to think about baptism and find that power again. In your mercy, please do that. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond understanding and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Speak our faith together with the words of the Apostles' Creed, page 7 and 8 of the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Mr. Jewel Lay, Mr. Jonathan James, if you could come forward. <laughs> Dear friends, as we just heard in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ sets you free from sin and death and made you members of his body, the church. Through word and sacrament, the Holy Spirit has nurtured your faith and increased your love. You have now been appointed to serve our Lord on behalf of this congregation. The Lord has entrusted you with responsibilities that you are to carry out according to his word. St. Paul wrote concerning service in the church, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. St. Paul spoke to all who serve the Savior. It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The Lord has promised to be with you and give you the gifts you will need to carry out the work entrusted to you. As servants of Jesus Christ and workers in this congregation, you are to set aside time for study of the scriptures so that you may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are to strive to be an example of Christian faith and life 
so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that the congregation may be assured of your willingness to serve, I ask you in the presence of God in this congregation, will you diligently and faithfully carry out the work entrusted to you according to the ability which God gives you? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I install you as members of the Church Council at Garden Homes Lutheran Church in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord pour out on you his Holy Spirit for the work you have been called to do that you may faithfully carry out all your duties and responsibilities with the Word of God as your confidence and guide. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I urge you to regard these fellow believers as servants of Jesus Christ and God's gifts to his church. Pray for them and support them in their service so that believers may be strengthened in faith and many others may come to know the Savior and the eternal hope he gives. Let us pray. Gracious God, you bless your church through the willing work and special gifts of so many people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to the servants we are installing today, that they may carry out their duties with diligence, wisdom, and humility. Encourage them to seek guidance from your word and lead them to pray for your direction. Help them to be good examples to others and support the work of the gospel ministry in this congregation. Keep them in your care and encourage them by your grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? Amen. The Lord bless you and make your service a blessing to others. Thank you, guys. I sincerely thank those who in the past years have served the Lord and his people with their time and abilities. May the Lord graciously bless all of you and those you have served. We join in the prayer of the church. Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Hold us and move us to be good examples for our youth. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Who loves to pray for these brothers and sisters and to help when we can. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Once again, you're welcome to hand in a prayer request or a volunteering stub with the offering. Thank you.
Please help us sing. Please stand. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll stay standing for our last hymn, 580.
Please be seated. Lots going on yet this morning here at Garden Homes. We have a Bible class. Pastor Bob Gurgle is going to talk about Christmas uh, isn't, isn't done. Christmas is today, yesterday, and forever. Looking at 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1. That'll be in the cafeteria down the school hallway. We have our Bible 101 class starting today, looking at uh, how to get more out of your Bible, how to read your Bible. We'll be practicing some Bible reading skills, uh, looking at uh, one of the most beautiful stories in the Bible, the parable of the lost son. That'll be in the room just before the cafeteria. We got uh, Jam, Jesus and Me, for our children, Sunday school this morning, and here in the church, if you don't... Uh, have a mind to go to any of those. We need helpers taking down the Christmas decorations this morning. So, hope a lot of you can stay for a lot of those things. February 25th, last Sunday in February, is our Black History Sunday, and the Hearts of Glow ladies are looking for help uh, setting up, taking down, putting up decorations, helping with the food, planning a program for after church in the gym. Uh, so, uh, there's you can sign up for that on the stub in your, in your bulletin or out in the lobby or just talk to one of the Hearts of Glow ladies. Offering envelopes for the new year are in the back. If you haven't grabbed yours, you can grab those. Anything else this morning? Great to start the new year with you. Thank you. God is good all the time. All the time. 